our amazing speaker to, to, to today. I've listened to her many times uh, talk about her new book and other things. And um, this is Dr. Lisa Miller. Lisa is, um, she has many accolades to her name, uh, a gifted writer. And uh, she runs, um, uh, she, she's a professor at um, uh, Columbia University uh, where she teaches all about the neuroscience of spirituality, which is of great interest to, of course, many of us in the 12 step community, you know. So uh, I thought I would invite her along and she very kindly accepted right away. She not only has uh, great knowledge and wisdom to share, but she really embodies, you know, what she speaks. I feel it radiates from her. So with, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you. I think you're Patrick, muted, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, Patrick, you. I'm so very, very grateful to join you. It's, it's a, I've been so looking forward to this. And I'm wondering if it's okay with you if we might start with the brief video to just orient the discussion. What if I told you that we have the antidote to the greatest epidemic of our time, suicide? and young adults. The rate of death by suicide now rivals the rate of death by auto accident in young adults. And basic science, clear as a bell, shows us that we are four-fifths less likely to take our lives when we have a strong spiritual life that is shared. There's nothing in the clinical or social sciences as profoundly protective against suicide. Together with my colleagues at Columbia Medical School, when we looked at structural MRI, when we looked at the architecture of the brain through MRIs, what we see is in people with a sustained spiritual life, broad and pervasive regions of cortical thickness represented in red. These are regions of perception, reflection, and orientation. With 80% overlap, these regions are not thick, but thin in people with recurrent major depression. Normally in an MRI study, you see an article published with it, there's a little tiny speck of difference. These are huge regions of the brain to show effectively greater processing power, a thicker cortex. The cortical thickness across the regions of the spiritual brain decreased the level of symptomology of depression one year out, a year from now. That is very strong evidence that indeed, spiritual life is neuroprotective against depression. The Army gets the same slice of American pie as does higher ed or entry-level jobs, 18 through 25 year olds. It's one story. It's our American story, and it's the epidemic of suicide. And so the Army decided to take a data-driven approach and support the spiritual core of every soldier. And in one year, we are already seeing a 28% decreased rate of suicide. Can higher ed do that? Yeah, of course higher education can do that. Can all of our institutions to receive young adults transform to support the spiritual core? Can we move from narrowly transactional relationships with young adults to ones that are loving, that are far more generative, that are transformational? People's personal spiritual life can be formed many ways. Some people say it is through prayer, meditation. Others say in nature. Nature is my cathedral. That's where I realize. And in fact, we have a great deal of science that says nature actually entrains the brain. Walking through nature does very much what prayer might do. It awakens our natural spiritual awareness. People realize their spiritual nature through many paths, one of which is religion. For about two thirds of people, they say, I am spiritual and I am religious. And then for about a third of people, they say, I am a profoundly spiritual person, but I am not religious. Both are good and both tap the same neural correlates. There's much strom and dross. I am Catholic, I am Jewish, I am Muslim. Well, actually, we're all using the same spiritual neural correlates. So I often hear people say, am I a spiritual person or how do you define spirituality? And you know, everyone is welcome to define it and know it and feel it exactly as they want. And it is also the case that just as we are born with two eyes, two ears, and a nose, we are born 
spiritual beings with a natural seat, a neuro seat of transcendent awareness. We are born, every one of us, with an innate capacity for spiritual awareness. There's one spiritual brain, and we all have it. When we realize our nature, when we build, if you will, and strengthen the spiritual core of who we really are, then our lives unfold in an entirely different way. Life is healthier. Life is far more full of resilience. Life looks different. It's far more of an adventure, an expedition. And when we boil down and look right at the data, where in the hundreds of peer review articles say beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's nothing as profoundly protective against the diseases of despair, the epidemic of our time, as a strong spiritual core. Over the past 25 years as a scientist and as a clinical psychologist, it's become crystal clear to me that suffering is an invitation for a deepening of spiritual life. But we have to say yes to it. Spirituality is not a life hack. Spirituality is a deep reorientation in our lives through which we see into the truer, more foundational nature of reality. There are always two realities, and they both matter. We are a point and we are a wave. We are magnificently distinct with GPS coordinates all over the globe and exquisitely diverse zipped up bio body suits. And at the very same time, we are part of one human heart, one field of life, one oneness, a unit of reality, one field of consciousness, loving sacred consciousness. And we are built to be able to toggle between these two realities. Every one of us is built to be able to perceive that we are exquisitely unique and we are part of one great sea of life. We are way oversold on the idea that we can control life. And we are really almost indoctrinated into an illusion that achieving awareness alone can be enough to handle the challenges of life. We must be able to look at life in a bigger way, in a deeper way. And that is our awakened awareness. Awakened awareness is when we shift and we say, what is life showing me now? What is being revealed here? It's a stance of deep curiosity, total observation. Observation of the eyes, yes, but also of the heart. But whatever our language, we are no longer controlling life. We are in a dynamic conversation with life. I think that in K-12, you know, I was taught to have the wrong conversation. I was taught to go after what I want and get it and give it every bit of strength I could so that I could win the day. And that's a helpful skill, but it's completely insufficient to live a meaningful, full life. So we need to teach children, and really maybe as adults, we need to help revisit this and teach ourselves to have a different conversation with life, to go from saying, what do I want and how am I gonna get it to the deeper, more fundamental question of what is life showing me now and what is life showing us now? So we need both achieving awareness and awakened awareness. And when the two go hand in hand, our life becomes a magnificent adventure. It becomes a quest. We're constantly part of the symphony, helping each other realize the grander opus. In this gift of life, we are loved, we are held, we are guided, and we are never alone. And not only that, we are given the ultimate opportunity to show up for one another so that we might be loving and holding and guiding and never leave anyone alone. That's the spiritual path.
Thank you for joining together. I'd like to offer you, if you'd like, a moment to explore your own natural birthright, your own natural capacity for awakened awareness, the awakening of the natural gift you were given of transcendent relationship. So if you'd like, this is an invitation. If you prefer simply to listen and watch, that's certainly fine. But I'll invite you into this brief 90 second practice. Before I share a practice, I like to honor the teacher who gave it to me. This practice was given to me by the late Dr. Gary Weaver. So I'm going to invite you to take five breaths and then we'll do a 90 second, if you wish, an invitation to a 90 second practice. I invite you in your inner chamber to set before you a table. This is your table. Into your table, you may invite anyone, living or deceased, who truly has your best interest in mind. Anyone living or deceased who truly has your best interest in mind. And with them all sitting there, ask them if they love you. And now you may invite your higher self, the part of you that is so much more than anything that you have or don't have, anything you've done or not done, your true eternal higher self. And ask you if you love you. And now finally, you may invite your higher power. However you know, whatever word is yours, your higher power. And ask them if they love you. And now with all of those people sitting there right now, what do they need to let you know? What do they need to tell you now? What do they need to share? And when you're ready, I invite you back. This is your birthright. This is your sacred endowment. No one can ever take this away. It is your innate capacity for a sacred transcendent relationship. Your hardwired awakened awareness. Now, as many of you may know, in the good attempt to be inclusive, post-industrial global culture threw out transcendent relationship from the public square. It was thrown out in the form of removing religion. And when that happened, so went the spiritual baby with the bathwater. And when that happened, so went the rich embrace of religious pluralism, where you tell me about Christmas and someone else says nature is my cathedral and I share Passover or Hanukkah and someone says Diwali was just here. We lost a spiritual public square. We lost a pluralistic public square. And 40 years is long enough for someone to grow up, have a child who grows up and is now the first generation of young adults who has never had the capacity nurtured in what we just shared here now. Now in this time of a very chilly public square, there has been a keeper of the transcendent relationship and that is you. AANA 12 steps have held on 
to the deep hardwired imperative that we walk in relationship to our higher power. And that the presence of this be in the love we have and devotion to one another, both forms of relational spirituality, those who truly have your best interest in mind and your direct relationship with your higher power. What the 12 step programs have held onto while the ice age froze center square, public boardrooms, classrooms, was the deep awareness that the narrow and brittle vision of human control is not only illusory, it is no way in and of itself to have a full and flourishing life. And so what I offer you today, I think will probably resonate as familiar, but let it be one more form, if you will, of witness, of testimony to the power of our relationship to the transcendent, our higher power and our love for one another. I'm gonna share with you now, if I might. Yeah. I'm so grateful to come to you from the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Columbia University, which we founded about 15 years ago. We founded it because students were showing up, students vote with their feet looking for a foundationally spiritual look into who we really are. And I'm joined here today by one of our star doctoral students, Ryan Sispanic, and also my dear colleague, Frank Peabody. We have some new members here. And I'm going to share with you what's in the awakened brain. I, I, may I turn to you, Patrick, to pronounce it in German? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be the good, best candidate on okay. my Irish. <laughs> but okay, we, I know we have somebody here who can You're pronounce here? the awakened in brain in, in German. I'm sure, yes, and then in and, Spanish. And, and then in Spanish. Yes. Okay, who would like to? So let me let me look through the <laughs> the screen here. I don't want to pick on anybody. So who would like to do it in German? You can just uh, raise your hand, and then we'll unmute you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe we could do it in Gaelic. Roshin might be able to do that. Beautiful. Okay, Ivan in Spanish. Okay, Ivan, can we unmute Ivan? Um, 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 one of our, uh, oh, million German. Very good. Yasha. Okay, let's get a Michael. bunch of languages. Okay. Mike is unmuted. Yeah, I okay. am. And uh, it would be das erwachte Gehirn. Von Lisa beautiful. Miller. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and we had some other people wanting to do it. Who else wants to do it? Maybe in another language. I think we had somebody who was going to do it in Spanish. Okay. Well, thank I'm you. Do it in Spanish. Oh, thank you. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Ah. What about Lovely. Yasha? What language do you want to do it in Yasha? Hi, thank you. I can do it in either German or French. So I'll do it in French. Um, le, le, le cerveau réveillé. Thank you. Beautiful. Ah, thank you. Uh, Garance? Is it Garance? What? Huh? I was going to say it in French, but my French Shiye can say it in Chinese. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in Chinese is Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can, uh, uh, shall we keep going? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a beautiful expression of a foundational truth, which is there is one spiritual brain in humanity and it we gain expression through the vivid, beautiful diversity of our cultures and religious traditions. And this is, this moment here, a beautiful encapsulation of the summary of science, which is what I will show you is that every single one of us on earth, every single one of us has a naturally spiritual brain. And of course there's human variants and we can strengthen it in various ways, but that said, there's one spiritual brain and we all have it. We can all awaken 
our natural spirituality. And when we do, it is expressed in ways that are both universal and vividly, magnificently diverse, like the beautiful languages we just heard here, different symbols, different practices, but they all emanate from a common seat of transcendent awareness that we just shared right now and engaged together. So just to put that in a more academic reductive way, <laughs> the gray circle is the beauty of our world traditions. The yellow circle is our birthright. And about two thirds of people in post-industrial global culture say that I live at the intersection. My deep spiritual life, my deep transcendent relationship and the capacity to feel that in my love for fellow humans and our earth is held in the embrace of my faith tradition. Whether I am Catholic, Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Sikh, whatever I may be, 30% of post-industrial global culture says I am spiritual, but I am not religious. For me, nature is my cathedral. In music, I feel connected to the loving guidance of the transcendent relationship. So whether or not we are religious, every one of us shares a natural, innate spiritual capacity. This is our birthright and we just shared it. Here is a letter as I come here, which many of you may have seen, to Bill Wilson from Carl Jung. Now, as you know, and Brian Sistanik, wave your hand, my gifted doctoral fellow who found this letter. This, Ryan, wave your hand. So can see. <laughs> yes, this is a letter, which as you know, in his time, um, Jung and Freud for a very good deal of time, and you can trace and look at their letters, um, were in deep correspondence. And at one point they broke. And one of the major differences was that Freud saw us basically as a closed system in a mechanistic sense, but Jung saw us as an open system in dialogue with the transcendent. And here we have Jung writing a letter to Bill Wilson. And I just wanna highlight this point here. The only right and legitimate, well, I'll back it up just a minute. Um, he's speaking of, of another gentleman, Roland, and he says his craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness expressed in medieval language as the union with God, the union with God. The only right and legitimate way to such an experience is that it happened to you in reality. And it can only happen to you when you walk on a path which leads to your higher understanding. You might be led to that goal by an act of grace or through a personal and honest contact with friends or through a higher education of the mind beyond the confines of mere rationalism. I see from your letter that Roland R has chosen the second way. And he goes on to discuss that specific person. Jung knew us as an open system in dialogue with a unit of consciousness field, if you've seen his red book. And here he sees, as Brian pointed out by finding this letter, and many of you may have seen it, as we move to the very, very end of the letter, you see alcohol in Latin is spiritus. And you use the same word for the highest religious experience, as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula therefore is at the very bottom, if you wanna take a screenshot, spiritus contra spiritus, spiritus contra spiritum. So here's the spiritual core. Here's the deep seat of transcendent awareness, which 12 step kept alive through the 20th century while everybody went stone cold. This is our birthright. This is who we are. And this is our seat of transcendent relationship. 
to our higher power and to that presence in and through one another. Relational spirituality. And what is remarkable is that the two axioms of the 12 steps share the same neurodocking station, the same seat of neuro awareness through which I connect with my higher power. I also connect with you in a relationship that is unconditional, loving, guiding, and never leaves anyone alone. What else might be said? Well, when we strengthen our awakened awareness, this deep seat of who we really are, we're strengthening our birthright. We, this, by way of comparison, every human capacity can be understood as a innate, environmentally formed, or as a blend thereof. Well, the big circle for religion, religion is a gift of our community, our ancestors, our family. It is entirely environmentally transmitted from person to person. Spirituality is innate. That deep red brain, <laughs> that deep capacity, the neuro docking station of transcendent relationship on day one, we all have it. One third innate, two thirds environmentally formed. And for many people, their faith tradition goes in the two thirds environmentally formed. For those who benefit from 12 step, the community, the practice, the authentic relationship of 12 step is in the two thirds embrace of the spiritual core. By way of comparison, temperament, we're all born maybe a little bit laid back or a little bit front footed. We're all born maybe open or closed. We all have a natural innate temperament. Well, temperament is half inborn, half environmentally formed, which means, well, I'll give you an example. I have three children. The middle child who goes by center child slept through the night as a tiny baby at 18 months. So for a year and a half, four times a night, and some of you may know this little sound. <laughs> I got up, I walked across the house and I soothed the baby environment. That baby's now 20. She sleeps through the night. She knows how to calm herself and she'll confess and has allowed me to share she's a little anxious. Our temperament is half innate, half environmentally formed. This means one third innate, two thirds environmental form, that while this is our birthright, our natural spirituality by comparison, it requires a great deal of effort for the right two thirds to cultivate and strengthen our spiritual core. And what you do in 12 step is to choose your environment. We, as we get older, as we're no longer eight years old or 18, we're in the world, we have a great deal of say in the two thirds environmental embrace onto our spiritual core. The company we keep, our inner practice, whether it's meditation or prayer, our lived spiritual values, these are matters of choice. And when we cultivate an environment, we strengthen our birthright through every decade of life. Now, this is not always that easy. Because again, we're in a public square absent the spiritual core. When post-industrial global culture through religion and spirituality out of the public square, we inherited a culture that became foundationally transactional in our relationship to one another. What can you do for me? Who are you? How can I put, you know, I can feel it at a dinner party. What do you do? And what does your husband do? And what do you, I can feel, to tick, I feel like I'm being, you know, ordered on a menu in Google or something. There's, there's absolutely no sense of this deep alternative, which you have very much in 12 step, which is an I vow relationship to truly have your best interest in mind. And rather than it being a transactional form of connection, it is transformational relational spirituality. Again, you have been the keepers, but it hasn't been easy. So you have found a way to get up on top of that tidal wave and live out your birthright. Live out your birthright. Well, the other way reason that this isn't so easy is not only do we have a tidal wave of a culture around us, but we are hardwired to have to work pretty hard, but ultimately to our great benefit to realize our deep spiritual nature. For most people, if you look at people who say, I have a very strong personal spiritual life, I turn to my higher power for guidance. That's a lived dynamic relationship, not just a belief. 
when I have a tough decision to make, when I'm up against the wall, I ask, what does my higher power want me to do? And receive a response in the heart, in my mind's eye, through a synchronicity. A synchronicity is God, your higher power, opening a door, right? Well, getting there, people who say, yeah, that's me, we are two and a half times more likely to have gotten there through suffering. And in fact, through depression, a major depression. People with a strong awakened awareness who walk a spiritual path get there more often than not. We are 250% more likely to have gotten there through despair. This is called a developmental depression and it is hardwired. It's hardwired at many seasons in our life, certainly to include coming of age. We can see this in longitudinal twin studies that from the inside out, right at the gateway to a lifetime path of addiction, right at the gateway, which is middle to late adolescence, emerging adulthood, that pathway, the trailhead, we have a surge. It's marked by a 50% increase in longitudinal twin studies, a surge, a hunger, a spiritual hunger. What is the nature of reality? What is my purpose? And I don't mean, am I gonna be a teacher or librarian or doctor? I mean, ultimate purpose in relation to the nature of life itself. And what is the nature of life itself? And everything you ever told me, mom, dad, pastor, priest, Amon, rabbi, it's up for grabs against the nuances, the resonance of the compass in my heart. That is spiritual individuation. And it comes back several times in life, certainly at midlife, certainly around moments of great loss and struggle, as well as moments of illumination. When we break through the narrow chamber of command control to a view that life is actually dynamic, when we shift the conversation from what do I want and how am I going to get it? I just didn't get what I wanted. That was not my plan A and that was not my plan B. But we shift and instead say, hey, awaken. What is life showing me now? What is life showing me now? This shift says that depression is a knock at the door, if you will. It is the spiritual hunger that is the ignition to move us into a deeper, more profound, understanding of life itself and awakening. You know, this knock at the door comes many times and we have a choice, we have a choice. So I'm going to invite you now, if I might, into a second practice. Is that okay, Patrick? Oh yes, Lisa, okay. anything you'd Thank like you. to do. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. okay, and the point I wanna share with you here is that oftentimes a developmental depression triggered by a loss, by a disappointment, by moments of shame or humility, by moments of deep pain is actually the trailhead, the knock at the door for an opening into a bigger life, into asking, what does my higher power show me now? Meditating, connecting with fellow souls on earth. Okay, so I'm gonna invite you now to take five breaths. I invite you to locate a time where you wanted something really badly. You wanted this so badly. It could have been, you know, a job. It could have been admission at a school. It could have been him or her to say yes. There was something you really wanted. It could have been a place to live. And you got it all lined up. I mean, you got A plus B plus C right. You researched it and you went for it and you gave it time. And that red door was yours. And as you planned and tactically strategized for that red door, you've done 99, everything you could do, you reach for the red door, you grab the handle and you can't believe that it's stuck. How could it be stuck? Because you've done everything right. A plus B plus C. It could have been shocking so much so it's hard to even understand. It could have been infuriating. It could have been depressing. But only because that red door was stuck, you had no choice and you pivoted, and you may have pivoted 20 degrees, you may have pivoted 50, 80, 120 degrees, and over there was a wide open yellow door. You might have said there aren't even yellow doors, but that door was shining and bright, and you went through that yellow door, 
And because you went through that yellow door on the other side was someone more right for you. You felt alive in a way you hadn't before, a friend, a partner. There was a new place of work that developed a side of you you didn't even know existed. It wasn't what you wanted, that yellow door. It was better than what you wanted. And because of that yellow door, you are where you are and you are who you are today. Now, as you look at that stuck red door and the hairpin turn that took you to the yellow door, was there anyone there who was helpful? It could have been someone that you've known for two minutes at the coffee shop or sat next to on the bus or the tube. It could have been someone you've known for years, like a grandma or a best friend that told you a story you've never heard before. But that person gave you information, guidance, encouragement. They were a trail angel. And as you step back now, sitting where you are now with your life, at that stuck red door, the hairpin turn, the trail angel, and the wide open yellow door, I invite you to reflect in your deep inner wisdom. How is life really built? How are the most important moments of our lives and the most important so-called decisions and the inheritances of our lives actually developed? And if I might invite you to sit way back now, stuck red door, hairpin turn, trail angel, and wide open yellow door, way, way back. Where in this road of life is your higher power? Is your higher power in the open yellow door and the stuck red door? Is your higher power in the trail angel? Is the higher power in your dialogue with, on both sides, the higher power? This is your vision. But might it be possible that you have been living in dialogue with the greatest force that is in us, through us, and around us? And is it possible, like rays of the sun, we are trail angels for one another? And ever more so here in a community of 12 Soul. And when you're ready, I invite you back. When we move out of radical, exclusive command control, achieving awareness where everything is perceived to be within our power and put our hand on the gear shift and change the conversation with life and awaken, use our awakened awareness to say, what is life showing me now? What is my higher power revealing to me now? Not why is this happening for me, but why, excuse me, not why is this happening to me, but why is this happening for me? Why is this happening for me? We're living in dialogue. We're an open system. And we are able to perceive, yes, through logic and empiricism, but equally through the equally important, if not more so, human faculties of intuition, gut awareness, a mystical experience, the multiple forms of human knowing. So that we can ask a question, what is my purpose? How will I get past this? And receive an answer of the heart, perhaps a mystical experience, a synchronicity that is perceived at the deeper level of unit of reality. We know that we are loved and held, we are guided, and we are never alone. The trail angel, the yellow door, the high pixel experience that opens up into something that we have yet to determine, but is much more than we ever knew prior to today. Here's where the rubber hits the road. Our global post-industrial culture has been through a time of trauma. And many of us have individually been through trauma. Well, what we see here is perhaps one of the most beautiful testimonies to how we are built. Everyone here in this study, it's over 3,000 people. Everyone to be in this study meets criteria for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. As we go out the x-axis, we see more and more and more struggle 
more anxiety, more flashbacks. But as we go up the y-axis, we see more and more growth, growth, more struggle, more growth, more struggle, more growth, more struggle, more growth until we get so far out, we need support to grow. Struggle is a gateway to growth. And in particular, this was a study by Sai, TSAI and colleagues, Tedeschi and colleagues said, well, how do I get up on that curve? What are the predictors? And the four predictors were access to the experience, not shoving it away, putting it in words, sharing it in a group, in a group, and then shining the light of spiritual awareness onto using our awakened brain through which there is a profound rearrangement of meaning. And then I saw we could both be forgiven. And then I knew my higher power had walked with me all along. And then I saw that my life and hers was a miracle. The deeper rearrangement of meaning that speaks and resonates with our deepest inner wisdom, post-traumatic spiritual growth. And this is indeed strengthening the red brain. When we use the struggle as a gateway, and again, we have to say yes, right? And walk the journey it is a knock at the door, just like developmental depression, a knock at the door really for a spiritual deepening. Now with developmental depression, it's often an endogenous spiritual hunger here. It can be a form of spiritual injury. Spiritual injury is when I felt closer to God or my higher power, and I now feel unworthy or even unable to pray. It goes hand in hand with trauma for many people. And yet there is a response to it and it is squarely, directly targeted, a spiritual form of engagement. You are tremendously important to one another because in a world marked by a tidal wave of radical illusions of control and latent radical materialism, which means it's only ready, real if you can touch it, you have held the vision that we can walk with each other in a form of relational spirituality. We can turn it over to our higher power in a public square that won't even acknowledge there is a higher power. We are hardwired to live the way that you walk. We are hardwired to hand it over and be in dialogue with our higher power. We are hardwired to be trail angels for one another. And when we are, and when we do, and when we live in dialogue, this is what happens to our brain, and it is splendid. This is a highly innovative, highly creative, and in the army we would say highly situationally aware, attuned brain that can ask a question of the head, why on earth is this happening now? And receive an inspiration of the heart. Ah, that can have a moment of inspiration and then discern its significance over time with the head. When we connect with the table of human knowing, the logician, the empiricist, the mystic, the intuitive, and sure, the skeptic, everyone together, we have a highly interconnected brain. We have paved the highways between regions of the brain, myelinated the tracks, which means we have a more integrated creative brain. Creative, yes, at work, but more important and creative in our lives so that we can see yellow doors so that we can both hear and show up as trail angels. This is how we are built. And when we realize our nature, we realize that there's often a very helpful response through the transcendent relationship as we just shared at our council, as you show up for one another, as your higher power shows up for you and you serve the greatest truth. We find meaning and direction. Struggle is an opportunity. It doesn't necessarily feel good. It is still an opportunity. And at the end of the day, although it doesn't come easy, we are drawn into the deepest relationship with life. And there is never, within all of the uh, human clinical sciences, social sciences, there is nothing that is profoundly protective. I want to make sure I find this. Ah, okay. There's nothing as profoundly protective against the most prevalent forms of suffering. A strong spiritual core 
prospectively, what does it mean about us in six months or a year from now? There's a decreased risk that we have a relapse, that we face addiction by 80%, 80% decreased relative risk. So in my family, if someone I love very, very dearly is an addict. If I could give this person a pill and you told me that this decreases by 80%, this person's likelihood of suffering again, I, would, I wouldn't even ask, I'd put it in their food, right? But this is how we're built. This is how we're built. This is who we really are. And when you look at the magnitude of the protective benefits, 80% less likely to have a relapse, 80% less, less likely to take our lives, 70% less likely to take really dangerous risks, like the we of 90 miles an hour, jumping out the second story window at a party, far less likely. But normally in the clinical sciences, if something's 20% protective, we're jumping for joy. You can buy it at the CVS or Walgreens. This is how we're built. And through the mess and grit of science, if we can still see that, then it may be that much of our suffering has to do with the foreclosure of the natural two-thirds embrace, the cultivation of our birthright. And as we realize who we really are and who we really are to one another, we reawaken in a much more whole way to return to the wholeness in the letter to Bill Wilson from Carl Jung. And not only right now is it true that each person walks through the gates of struggle or developmental depression to awaken, but it may be that right now as a global post-industrial culture, we are in a shared post-traumatic developmental depression. And maybe we are at the birth, maybe this is the ignition of a collective spiritual awakening. And you're needed because you already walk the walk. You're needed and you know how to shepherd and walk by someone's side. When we build it, it lasts. It lasts. Once it's found, it lasts. It's 90% stable, the capacity through which to be in a state of awakened awareness. We understand life differently, right? When we look through life with our red brain, who are we? Who are we to one another? Well, in the center field, tidal wave of the public square, who am I? I am the one who actually, I was in the bottom third of my high school class. Actually, I'm the one that I, I just didn't pay my rent. Who am I? I am my performance, my pieces, my parts. Well, who am I told with an awareness that we're actually souls on earth? We're actually like rays of the sun, emanations of source, children of God, whatever word is yours. Well, who are you then? You are a soul on earth. And what is it to be oh so smart or be able to pay the rent or not? Well, that's just the constellation of endowments through which we carve our path. That's not who we are. And if I'm a soul on earth, you're a soul on earth. And our relationship is about interest. It's about commitment. On a tough day, it's about forgiveness. You took my girlfriend. I'm furious, but I don't want to kill you. We are bonded more deeply. You have a different idea. Well, I find that irritating, but I still love you. <laughs> we are more foundationally connected. We have a civil society. Here's all the good stuff that people talk about, the character strengths and virtues, grit, perseverance. Well, it turns out that despite a great deal of conversation about these character strengths, they actually all load into the same people. The same person who has grit, has gratitude and forgiveness, and the same person that's in blue. Now, this is 5,500 people. And the folks in red right now are struggling with meaning and struggling with gratitude. And we can move from red to green to blue, to green to blue. To, but the bottom line is the character, our capacity to show up, and be there for one another in an I that way is a global trait in our lives. And we cultivate it and build it like a verb. It is not a noun. It is not that he is a person of character and she is not, but rather that he is on a journey to strengthen his character as is she. Now this process of character is rooted for 85% of people in daily spiritual awareness, the red brain the seat of transcendent relationship to one another and to the higher power. 
It is a way of navigating and knowing amidst a public square that is radically transactional, that we are souls on earth helping each other along as trail angels. Okay, this is a statement, as absurd as it looks, of the fact that this is no longer fringe. This is not fringe. Barron's, the Wall Street Journal, ABC News, this is now center field. And the US Army is also using the same science that I've shared with you here. This science is a roadmap. It is a reflection. It is a form of witness, a chorus of human experience in the study sample. That can be a way of strengthening our spiritual core in the army. A soldier must now be fit of body, mind, and spirit in a way that is pluralistic and inclusive, just like 12 step, your own notion of the higher power. And together with my colleagues, we are welcoming young people and those who work with them, whether it's faculty or coaches, anyone who helps young people to Awakened Campus Global. So the Awakened Campus Global might be a launch of a post-industrial view of the university that embraces the spiritual core, strengthens the spiritual core. Developmental depression is an opportunity. Right now, we're in a collective, perhaps shared developmental depression. But what comes out of this is a quest, the quest that allows us to pave the highways between regions of the brain, to be able to understand life at head and heart working together. This is who we are. The science is in the awakened brain. Practices are in the awakened brain. And the awakened brain also has stories of people who going through a developmental depression awakened to what became their new life plan and path. I've traveled to many places sharing the science. And when people are stuck and they don't know how to instantiate, how do we build a spiritual community? What do we do for a spiritual treatment? Whatever the challenge may be, whether it's addiction, whether it's depression, whether it's loss, whether it's just a wellness group, I'll share with you that I hear time and time again, people modeling 12-step program, modeling AA, modeling NA, because the DNA of what you have actually is built on the DNA of who we are. Thank you for how you lead us and how we need you at this time.